On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy rode in a parade through the streets of Dallas, Texas, sitting in a convertible limousine with its top down. Nellie Connolly, wife of Texas Governor John Connolly, turned from the front seat saying, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Seconds later, gunshots rang through the Dealey Plaza. One bullet, a direct hit to the head. President Kennedy was pronounced dead 30 minutes later. That afternoon, suspect Lee Harvey Oswald, a former Marine who had defected to the Soviet Union, is grabbed by police in a Dallas movie theater and later named as the assassin. As the U.S., still in shock, mourned the loss two days later, Oswald is shot dead in the basement of the Dallas police headquarters by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Roby. Those are facts. 60 years later, a majority of Americans do not believe Oswald acted alone. What facts support opinions on all sides? Sixty years ago, the U.S. was in turmoil over the assassination of JFK. On this episode of About the Law, we'll be discussing the various theories and unknowns. I'm Lainey Law. I'm attorney Andrew Myers. And today we have two special guests with us. We have local About the Law celebrity Doug Cope with us here today. And we also have a new face, Brian Doyle from Johnstown, Colorado, a JFK researcher for the last 32 years and a U.S. history major. How are you guys doing today? Very good, very good. Very good. Thank you for having good, me. Good, good. So yeah, this is this is an issue that um, I guess with the older generation uh, is is still on their our minds. But I think a lot of younger people care about it too. Um, there are a lot of uh, different uh, viewpoints. Uh, some people, and, and we kind of represent those different uh, viewpoints. Some people believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. In pulling the trigger, Doug Cope is going to, um, because that's how he feels, tell us uh, what supports that theory. I believe it was a mafia hit. I've done a lot of reading, and um, I, I think it was a mafia hit. I really do. But Mr. Doyle um, has another view that uh, there was involvement by the CIA and the United States government. Do I have that right, Brian? Yes, you do. So why don't we start... Uh, Doug, uh, we'll we'll start with you and the basic facts. And how how is it that uh, you, Doug, uh, feel that it was Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone? Well, I mean, I'm basing that on the findings of the Warren Commission, which of course was put together by uh, well, then President Johnson, uh, following the shooting, and they worked for nine months. They interviewed hundreds of people, and they uh, issued a report. And there were a lot of uh, you know very um, important uh, people on this commission, including a future president, Gerald R. Ford. And they, uh, fo their findings uh, basically said that, yes, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Now, the rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald used uh, was an Italian-made uh, rifle, Carcano rifle. Uh, and that rifle, he, yeah, he, he purchased that via mail order uh, under an assumed name uh, something that now we hope is certainly not uh, not possible, but back then it certainly no. was. No, and that not. rifle uh, was found on the sixth floor of the school book depository building in Dallas, Texas, where Lee Harvey Oswald was an employee. So he had access to that building. Uh, he had a weapon. And later, um, following the shooting, uh, that weapon was found hidden amongst a bunch of boxes that were on the sixth floor. And as I read, they, they went over that rifle, really, uh, with a fine-tooth comb. And ultimately, they found uh, fingerprints that were his and a, uh, a handprint uh, uh, that was his, a palm print uh, that was his as well. So, um, you know, this was evidence that I think was uh, incontrovertible at the time. And he was arrested a short time later, as I recall, oh. it was a movie theater uh, where he was. Yes. Arrested. And uh, I don't recall the name of the movie now, but somehow, as I recall, Texas, it was, it was the Texas it, movie theater. Yeah. 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 And um, he was arrested there. And basically, um, 
you know, the, the Warren Commission said that following their investigation, they found no connection to any conspiracy. Now, there have been any number of conspiracy theories over the last, well, six decades. Uh, information, much more information is now available to the public than was available back then. And of course, the world at that time, uh, we had gone through the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion in Cuba, which was a disaster. And we had also gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where Russia uh, was forced to take its nuclear weapons out of Cuba. So the world the world was kind of topsy-turvy at that time, mm -hmm. uh, as it is now for other reasons. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there is some theory that um, the government uh, or the commission wanted the uh, their determination to be that Oswald acted alone because of the way the world was at the time. They didn't want to scare people. They didn't want to, you know, invoke a Russian invasion or or a communist plot or anything like that. But still, when you look at all the conspiracy theories, um, none of them really have good, solid evidence that can be proven. And then, of course, there's Jack Ruby. And I know we want to talk about Jack Ruby maybe a little bit later on, but there's also no evidence uh, of a conspiracy involving Jack Ruby, who, of course, shot uh, and killed Oswald in the in the basement of the uh, the Dallas uh, police station, I believe the jail there. Uh, uh, well, the so well, you say there's no evidence. Yeah, yes. yeah but I'm going to agree to disagree. All right, very good. Let's let let's hear it. You talk about Jack Ruby and how there's no evidence. Uh, it turns out that um, in the month before the assassination, Jack Ruby telephoned mafia frontman Erwin Weiner, Jimmy Hoffa associate Robert Baker, Louisiana mob boss Carlos Marcello, who I want to talk about a lot more, uh, Santos Traficante associate Louis McWilly, and other organized crime figures. Um, Ruby's visits to Cuba uh, where he is believed to have helped funnel mob money to the United States and secured Santos Traficante's release from Castro's Cuba. Uh, and right after um, a very well-known um, journalist and also a game show host by the name of Dorothy Kilgallen had actually interviewed uh, Jack Ruby in jail, she died under very mysterious circumstances, and there is a really good book on that subject. People will tell you that a jury will always look for three things, motive, means, and opportunity, and all three of those are present here, Doug. Um, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy's brother, was described as a ruthless man willing to use extra legal means to his own ends. Uh, he used excesses that included warrantless, likely illegal wiretaps and bugging of homes and meetings of places of mobsters and associates. Um, he was on what was known as the Rackets Committee, in which uh, 49 mobsters closely associated with the Teamsters were outed. 141 Teamsters officers tied to improper or criminal activities uh, were heard. Um, Bobby Kennedy was an enemy of the mob and organized crime in America, and he was no friend of theirs. He, both in uh, the committee uh, back in the late 50s and early 60s that prosecuted organized crime, and then later as the president's brother, you know, went after organized crime. This is important, and here's the motive: when um, John, when John Kennedy's father, Jack Kennedy, went to organized crime and asked them to help elect JFK, and money exchanged hands, and the mob did in fact help. By all indications, when the mob did in fact help elect JFK by throwing the election in both Chicago and in West Virginia. Um, the mob was, you know, especially uh, Sam Giancana, who was known as the organized crime leader in Chicago. He asked Jack Kennedy, he said, you know, we don't like Bobby. Bobby has been on our butt all of these years and we really are not happy about it. Well, uh, the old man, Jack Kennedy, said, oh, this is John Kennedy. It's not Bobby Kennedy. So with assurances that John Kennedy would not continue this pattern of persecution, uh, the mob uh, kind of agreed and they did help. 
Well, what's the first thing John Kennedy did when he got elected? He named his brother as attorney general, and his brother continued the mob persecutions. Just one little thing that he did. Um, Carlos Marcello, the uh, mob boss down in New Orleans, uh, was no friend of Bobby Kennedy's all through the 50s. Now, Bobby Kennedy is the um, attorney general and uh, President Kennedy, you know, kind of looked the other way as Bobby had Carlos Marcello without any notice at all deported to Guatemala. They dropped him off in the jungle of Guatemala in his street clothes. And he, you know, called a friend of his, David Ferry, who was really important to this whole story. David Ferry flew down to Guatemala and brought Carlos back uh, in his uh, airplane. So, this podcast isn't meant to delve into everything because this history goes on and on and on. But organized crime in America, both in Chicago, uh, in New Orleans, in Florida, where uh, Santo Traficante ran uh, games numbers, um, were furious. They were furious at JFK for that and a lot of other reasons. Means, Lee Harvey Oswald, who you spoke of, Doug, knew from his boyhood forward David Ferry, an investigator for Carlos Marcello. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, when he grew up in New Orleans, lived with the Dutz Murrett family. This is one of Oswald's uncles. So there you have a connection directly between Lee Harvey Oswald and the mob. And Dutz Murrett, his uncle, uh, was known to be a bookmaker for Carlos Marcelo. So you've got motive, you've got means. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any I don't think anybody needs to question that the mob has the means and the opportunity to, to Yeah, but would do they things. be stupid enough to do something like this and stir the pot like this? Well, they did, didn't they? I I I just can't think that even the mafia would want to be behind something like this because it would make whatever they do in the future even more difficult because you're going to have a lot more crackdowns and the part of law enforcement. And even the mafia doesn't want to stir the pot that much. Well, know? Doug, they did. I'm showing you a book. I'm showing you a really good book that was written by um, Frank Regano with a uh, co-writer, Selwyn Robb. Uh, Regano uh, represented Santos Traficante. He represented Jimmy Hoff and a lot of others. Interesting, interesting reading. Santo Traficante, just days before uh, he passed away, admitted that, uh, and I'll read the quote directly, uh, leaving just a couple of words out for YouTube. Who would have thought that someday JFK would be president and he would name his GD brother attorney general? I think Carlos Marcello effed up in getting rid of JFK. Maybe it should have been Bobby. And the author goes on to say, to my astonishment, abruptly and without warning, he was confessing that he and Carlos Marcello had conspired to kill the president. So there, uh, as you pointed out, the Warren Commission came out with its findings. And interestingly, 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 Doug, uh, the Warren Commission report was in one volume. Attached to that one volume were 28 volumes of evidence. The yeah. actual report ignored most of that. A lot of stuff was in those volumes. Uh, fast forward to the late 70s, and so many people were saying something was wrong about this whole thing. Something was just terribly wrong with the Warren Commission's, what a lot of us think was whitewashing. So they established the uh, House Committee on Assassinations. Right. And without delving into the whole thing, again, there's a lot of history. And we could talk about this you know, for 14 episodes, as some people have. <laughs> but mysteriously, 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 Two key people who were going to testify to the House Select Committee on Assassinations disappeared right before they were supposed to testify. Sam Giancana, we come back to him, was cooking peppers in the basement of his house outside Chicago on June 19th, shortly before he was expected to appear before that committee. Somebody offed him. They put a bullet in his mouth, and I think we all know what that means. Johnny Rosselli was also scheduled to appear before that commission, and he disappeared on July 28th of 1976. His body was found 10 days later, chopped up in a barrel floating in the Bay of Miami. So, you know, you say there's no 
evidence. There certainly is more than uh, I think a lot of people would say circumstantial evidence. In a lot of cases, based on circumstances, circumstantial evidence succeeds. So you ask, would 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 the mob be so forthright as to do such a thing? I don't know, Brian. Would the government be so forthright as to participate in this? Absolutely. So the government and the mob, I think the the CIA and the mob work together to do this. Okay. The Warren Commission. Okay. Um, I have read this book. I have been. I go back and forth. This is. Um, this would actually a book that would put together um, to basically just help the American the uh, American public just to say, hey, we did our I investigation. We found that Lee Harvey Oswald acted by himself. There were three shots, all came from the book depository, case closed. What we know now, with the facts that we have now, um, there is not a jury in the U.S. that would convict Lee Harvey Oswald by himself. Okay, if you look at the Zapruder film, if you look at um, the facts of the case, we know for a fact from um, the vial that were uh, that were released back in 2021 that Lee Harvey Oswald was hired was brought in by the CIA when he was in the Marines, when he was in stationed in Japan. And um, you know what, when you're, when you are working with the CIA, you're always in the CIA, okay? I'm not saying that Oswald, um, that he is completely clear free in all this. He was involved, but he was exactly uh, he had uh, he had exactly what he said he would. He is a patsy. He was set up, and he was silenced by Jack Ruby, and then Jack Ruby died in prison. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that um, the government actually gave him cancer, and he died a few years later. Uh, I believe he died in what in nineteen sixty eight. Yeah, it was sixty eight or yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So 67 or 68. Yeah. There are so much evidence now to say that yes, the mafia, the CIA, the government was behind the assassination of President Kennedy. One thing that I thought was interesting was that the American Bar Association held two mock trials. Oh, a number of years ago. I don't remember exactly when it was. Uh, uh, Brian, you say that no jury would um, convict Oswald. Well, before the papers were released that you're talking about, the ABA held two mock trials and they went opposite ways. One jury convicted Oswald and one jury did not convict Oswald and acquitted him. And that's before these papers were uh, released. So that's just an interesting little fact. I was Well, maybe ask that's why Jack Ruby went after him, because he was afraid that Oswald was not going to be uh, convicted. And uh, sure, he took, uh, he took uh, the matter into his own hands. But uh, here's Jack Ruby. He owning a nightclub in, uh, you know, in that area. And yeah, he had some connections to uh, some local uh, ne'er-do-wells, as I understand. But uh, there he is. He's across the street from the Dallas police station at uh, the, you know, what the Western Union office says, uh, wiring some money to one of his employees. And he drives there in his car. He leaves his two dogs in the car. Now, the guy connected with the mafia who's part of a conspiracy, you're leaving your two dogs in the car? I don't think so. And then he goes over and just, yes, the Dallas Police Department was very lax in its security. Were they in on it too? I don't know. I don't think there's any proof. The guy walks right in, walks right down to the basement, pulls out a gun, fired three shots, I think, three or four. And that was the end of Oswald. And then we'll never know what uh, Oswald's true motive was, because the only person who really could say what his motive was is now dead. So, um, I mean, at the time, Jack Ruby basically said he was acting as a good American. 
that he was. Oh, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A good American a bypass the right. justice good American. system. I don't think right. anybody will buy he that. I don't think sure any. Oswald got his comeuppance, his just desserts. So, Doug, Doug he answer. was. So, so, here's the thing about Jack Ruby. He was uh, basically stalking Oswald on Friday night. He was in the Dallas police station. At one point in time on Friday night, he tried to get into the into the interrogation room to uh, get at Oswald. Uh, he was at the press conference. We have pictures of Ruby at that press conference. He oh, was yeah, there yeah. Saturday. Yep, he was. Okay, he. Um, th th this was not just. Um, th 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 this was not something that he just, you know, said. Uh, uh, he 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 just thought of. Uh, pretty much on Sunday morning, he planned this out. This was something that he was told to do, I think, um, weeks ahead of time. Now, I know he, he did die of cancer in prison. Well, he was convicted. Then uh, he appealed, and I believe that he was asking for a change of venue, I believe. Yes. Um, now, you're also saying that the government... Uh, gave him cancer. That's what I'm saying. How how did they how did they do that? Oh, that'd be easy. That's well, easy. No, how, that's how did easy. they do that? How did they no, do? The government that? did it. You know, he 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 locked up. He is in uh, basically solitary confinement, basically uh, for that amount of time. They could put something in his food. They could, you know, uh, the medications that they were giving him. That's easy. Can I just point out that um, Ruby uh, had deep, deep, deep organized crime uh, connections, and that can never be disputed. Ruby was a friend and business associate of Joe Civello, Marcello's top deputy in Dallas. Ruby was also very close to Joe Campisi, considered to be the number two man in the Dallas mafia hierarchy. Campisi was on such good terms with Marcello that he sent the Marcello family 260 pounds of homemade sausage every Christmas. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, but I'll give you the motive as to why Jack Ruby did it. And that's because he was in a great deal of arrears in a lot of his payments. He owed a lot of people a lot of money. And these leaders that I could go on and on telling you about, you know, made a promise that, you know, we'll help you out of this, Ruby, but you got to be our boy. You got to do what we're going to tell you to do. And so he had the um, motive to take care of uh, Oswald and wipe him out so that he would not talk. Um, Jack Ruby uh, was in jail and never talked to anyone. During his trial, he never talked to anybody except for um, one person, and that's um, Dorothy Kilgallen. Uh, somewhat got a little bit friendly with him and his attorneys during his trial. And then when he was found convicted and he did jail time, uh, he really didn't want to talk to anybody. He felt that he was in grave danger in Dallas. He had begged to be moved out of Dallas and taken to Washington so he could testify as to what really happened. Dorothy Kilgallen was the only person that ever, ever, ever really sat down and interviewed him at, in depth in jail. She had notes and all of her friends knew she had notes. All of her friends and associates knew that she was going to come out with a book. And it was pretty well known that she was a journalist digging into Jack Ruby. She died under mysterious circumstances, including what um, kind three of circumstances? There well, are she, so many witnesses that died she, under those circumstances. She died so with witnesses. three different. She died with three different medications in her bloodstream, two of which were never even prescribed to her. She died in her bed, and interestingly, all of her notes, which all of her friends knew about, because she protected them, she carried them around in her purse and in a in a folder. Uh, her notes were gone. Her notes were gone. So is it a mystery? Yes. Is it evidence? It's something that a jury, juries are always told in the in their jury instructions, you may draw reasonable inferences. So I'm telling you, yes, that's, uh, that's evidence. And a jury could draw whatever inferences they want to the fact that she was offed. Now, well, it, it sounds you, like something out of The Godfather. This is a mass cover-up because here's the thing with the government, okay? Um, look, we all know that President Kennedy 
he made no friend during his time in office. Okay, with the Bay of Pig fiasco, mm -hmm. he he wanted to disband the CIA. Okay, he made a lot of friends with girls. That's true. <laughs> That's true. very true. Um, but there was a lot of people in, um, and they wanted him out of office. They wanted him gone. Okay. They worked together with the mafia, with a lot of other, um, and they put this together, um, and it was planned out. This was just not a spur of the moment thing. There is no way that Oswald could have known that the top of the limo was off that day. There was no way that he could get those three shots off and done the amount of damage to two people with two shots, I'm sorry, not three, because we forget about James Tagg, the gentleman that was nicked by a fragment under the underpass mm -hmm. because they said that two shots did all um, that the two shot did all of that damage. Common knowledge, common sense. We all know there's no way that did all of that. There's no way. And the other thing on the shots, as long as we're in the in the Dealey Plaza, um, there is strong evidence. And I'm talking about the 28 volumes of evidence uh, appended to the Warren Commission report, not the garbage that's in that uh, book called the Warren Commission. There are 28 volumes of evidence of witness statements, photographs, all kinds of good stuff. And there is a great deal of evidence in those volumes that many, many, many people, including law enforcement, heard shots from the grassy knoll, not up from the uh, Texas School Book Depository. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people actually heard shots from what's called the grassy knoll. And I know it's gotten a bad name, but the fact is there is evidence that many, many, many people heard gunshots from there. There were um, law enforcement there and they all ran up there. They all ran up there. There was a wall and whoever may or may not have shot the shots from there ran. So, yes, there is evidence of a second gunman uh, on November 22nd. The other thing about um, about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and I have it, there is a, a portion of a deposition that was done of Richard Helms, who was the later the head of the CIA. He was up and coming in the CIA. There's a deposition of Richard Helms in which he is asked directly, you know, they went around and around and around and what they knew about Lee Harvey Oswald and did they know about his background? He, Richard Helms was asked the direct question, was Lee Harvey Oswald ever on the payroll of the CIA redacted? Why? Why, Why was that redacted? Exactly. Why? That's all I need. That's really <laughs> all I need. Uh, I... I don't go quite as far as you, Brian, and I'm happy to give you plenty more time. I don't go as far as you that there was that much United States involvement. I think it, I think it was a mafia hit, pure and simple. If it was a government hit, and I, I do think the FBI at least looked the other way because J. Edgar Hoover has a whole other history, which we could do 90 episodes on. And the CIA has a history, too. But what I was going to say is that he hated I the think, Kennedys. He did. Oh, they all hated it. Jay, Hoover hated the Kennedys. He taped them having sex with their girlfriends so that he could. <laughs> well, it's true. He, he, well, he, ta Hoover, he taped Hoover, them having sex with their girlfriends so that he could blackmail them. Hoover didn't like anybody. <laughs> well, he liked himself and his friend. I forget his friend's name. Do you remember his friend's name, Brian? Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't. So, <laughs> in any event, um, Brian, let me ask you this question though. Um, again, I don't go quite as far as you. I think the I think the federal government, at the very least, looked the other way or was incompetent, as they are in a lot of things. Um, why is it if it's such a huge, huge, huge thing that involves so many, many people in the FBI and the CIA or whoever? Why hasn't somebody talked? Why didn't somebody say something in all these years? Because I think now, uh, 60 years later, we're actually starting to hear people talk. We There was a great uh, film last night um, called JFK, What the Doctors Saw on Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. The doctors um, from Parkland Hospital. Uh, the doctors that were actually there um, that day that were in the operating room. And they all said we were too scared to talk. 
we were told by the Secret Service, by the by the FBI, to keep our mouth shut. We were told to say all the shots came from the back or else. No, there okay. was a frontal shot. There was a frontal shot. And Correct. what was the doctor's name? Was his name? Dr. Perry, Dr. Perry, Dr. Perry, who he went with, you know what? His first press conference, he said there was a shot. He thought the shot came from the front. Mm -hmm. When he was, uh, when he talked to the Warren Commission, he then said, oh, no, I was wrong. The shot came from the back. Well, he was told to say that because so many witnesses ended up dead. So many people ended up dead. Now, I think, okay, yes, the mafia, they had some involvement with this, but only the government had the capability to do this sort of cover-up. One and thing that supports talked, what you ended up dead. One thing that supports what you're saying is that um, Kennedy was pronounced dead at Parkland Medical Center in Dallas, mm -hmm. and they were in the process of getting the body to the coroner. And oh no, Secret Service and Lyndon Johnson stepped in. Oh no, we're taking him back to Washington, and that's what they did. And there was a fight. There was a fight mm -hmm. uh, at the hospital yeah. between the local mm -hmm. officials who said, "This is a death." In our jurisdiction and Texas That's state statute requires yep. that the right. local coroner do the autopsy. Oh, no. And there was actually a bit of a physical scuffle <laughs> with right. the um, coffin and they grabbed it and took it back to Bethesda and did whatever they did. I don't know if it was an autopsy or whatever they did. And then finally, the final thing that deepens the mystery is, is that his funeral was a closed coffin funeral. Thousands, if not tens of thousands of people um, went into the Capitol building rotunda uh, on Sunday, November 24th, uh, or was it the 25th? I forget. The, and coffin was closed. Not a soul saw Kennedy. Jackie saw him, but whatever oh. she saw went to the grave with Jackie. So, I, I don't think that's so unusual considering the severity of the wounds. I mean, uh, you know. I mean, I think they normally can cover that yeah. stuff up. Yeah. My thought with the closed casket, too, is I question, I, I just presume that he's not even in there to begin with. I would be surprised, like, <laughs> in any state, um, regardless of what the situation is. I mean, you already have that high profile assassination. I feel like they wouldn't even trust the body to be among the public at that point. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I think the CIA and the um, FBI obviously had some involvement, even if it was only looking the other way. But, Doug, you know me and you know that I have an incredible doubt about our government and, and yes. their abilities and capabilities. So I just wonder, I mean, fast forward a little bit. And this is not off topic, but later in that decade, the Pentagon Papers were revealed showing just our awful decisions that were made uh, in, in getting entrenched in Vietnam. And that was all due to the effects of a whistleblower. So, Brian, why isn't there a whistleblower that's come forward and you know written a document like the Pentagon Papers telling us just how the government did do this? And I said, I think that... Um... There was, uh, there was enough evidence that if you talked, if you, um, if you were baldy enough to talk, you were killed. Um, there are so many people that, um, that if you knew so much and that tried to come out publicly, they ain't, and they ended up dead. People changed their testimony. They kept quiet all these years. Um, and I just think that the cover up, um, was so well done that pretty much at the end of the day, um, they all knew that the government is very powerful. And if you talked, you would, um, you would, you, you, you would, you would wind up dead. I was very disappointed with the, um, select committee on assassinations that was appointed by Congress to look into both uh, you know the Martin Luther King assassination the Kennedy and uh, the Kennedy assassinations plural sadly very sadly um, I was disappointed because they did come out and say in fact 
that the JFK assassination was, in fact, very likely the result of a conspiracy, mm -hmm. but they didn't know who the parties were in the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. My contention is that's because a lot of them were off, including, as I said before, of uh, Johnny Rosselli and uh, Momo Giancana. Uh, so I think we all know that the group of people that we're talking about. And Doug, I, I do think that there's evidence. Yes. I think there, I think there's clear evidence. But to answer your question further, when you say, well, why isn't there more clear evidence? That's because we're dealing with a group of people that don't like write letters and say, oh, guess what, Laney? Next <laughs> week I'm gonna next week I'm gonna do this and that. Okay, could you could you make five copies of this? We're dealing with a group of, <laughs> well, we're dealing with a group that doesn't they don't do things that way. I think we went back and forth jokingly on the email or text yesterday saying, you know, never uh, write when you can speak, never yes. speak when you can nod. Yeah. I forget the rest of the saying. Never nod when you can wink. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, I wonder that on the 100th anniversary of this in 2063, all of a sudden there's going to be some revealing publication of some kind that's going to tell the whole story uh, start to finish. And, uh, you know, maybe this is just speculation on my part, but, um, you know, I mean, was it the mafia? Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, was it, was it a reincarnation of the Godfather? Leave the gun, <laughs> take the cannoli. Or, you know, was it a government conspiracy? I don't know. I worked in government for eight years and believe me, there ain't a lot of smart people in government. So, is that why you got out, Doug? You just couldn't well, stand being with all those I idiots. Got out, well, I, I was forced out by a guy who ran for president a few years after that. Hmm, who would that be? But anyway. Um, let me just add something yeah. here, and that is that we're, we're we're not making any bones that we're some kind of a deep documentary that's going to go on for 90 episodes, which you would, to really dig into this whole thing. Because, yes. like I said, there's 28 volumes of evidence uh, that are appended to the Warren Commission report. And uh, you can actually go online, and I have a little icon yes. on my computer, and go into the National Archives and start sure. reading stuff. That's yep. where I found that deposition where uh, Richard Helms was asked, you know, gee, uh, was... Uh, Mr. Oswald, ever on your payroll, redacted. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but for people who are interested in this, there's a professor out at University of California, and I forget what campus, but it's online, Professor Daniel Sheehan. Professor Daniel Sheehan teaches a class in the Kennedy assassination, and the lectures are uh, an hour and a half, two and a half hours, but they're online, so you can start them and stop them, start them and stop them, well, you know, well, don't, and don't. it's, it's, he, he goes into a great deal of depth on all of the different things we're talking about. Doug, you would love his initial episode and you should watch it because well, after well, his don't. first episode, I was convinced that you're right after his first lecture, but then there were, I think, 14, 15, 16 other lectures that go way deep into what Mr. Doyle's talking about. Now, maybe he was going to write a book and the book hasn't come out yet as far as I know. And maybe it's because these additional documents, Brian, that you're talking about have not been. In fact, I actually contacted him once and surprise, surprise, he never got back to me. But I think he's going through all of those documents and I think we'll have a better resource, but I'm just recommending to anybody that is watching this to check out Daniel Sheehan's University of California college course because it's all online. You can take the class. So End the documents uh, that came out, the the one that uh, Trump released in twenty in 2017, and then the uh, one that Biden released in 2021, um, we were told the same thing by both presidents. We're going to release some of them. Not all of them. Why due not? To what national yeah. security? Oh, bull! National security. What? what? Bull. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> mafia. What? What national security? It's been sixty yeah. years. Yeah, they use the national security. Uh, they use the national security excuse for Vietnam, 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 <laughs> until it turned out that they right. blew it because they didn't know what they were doing. So don't tell me national security. National security means we screwed up and we don't want to tell you. That what that is what <laughs> our government had told us for the last sixty years. Um, let's well, let, let's change track just a little bit, yes. a little bit. 
Doug, you and I are actually old enough to remember that day. Brian, I don't know if you are old enough to remember that day. Are you? I'm not. I'm 45. I'm not. Yeah. No. Doug, well, what I, do you remember? What do you remember about the day that JFK was assassinated? Yeah, you and I uh, discussed this for a little bit, but yes, I I do remember that day. I was in elementary school. Uh, I was nine years old uh, in elementary school in New Jersey. And I remember that we were uh, let out of school early because, as you know, it happened in the morning. Uh, we were let out of school early in the day, earlier in the day. And uh, I went home and uh, my mother was there and she was she was crying about the whole thing. Um, she was very upset that this had happened. Uh, you know, again, um, people at that time weren't weren't used to having shootings of this type, assassinations of this type. This was a very unusual occurrence. And here was a, uh, a president, again, the youngest president who had ever served, young family, uh, served in World War II, was part of the greatest generation. And uh, most of the people who voted for him were of the greatest generation. And uh, here he was cut down uh, by someone in the, in the prime of life while serving his country. So it was a very, it was a very difficult time. And again, right at that time, the world was also pretty tense and we were, had a, a pretty severe cold war going on with the Soviet Union. So there were a lot of right. fingers being pointed at the time, but uh, yeah, it was a very, a very difficult situation. Uh, you know, when I, when I got home that day, I don't, I don't really remember, um, the events of the following days, but I do remember coming home from school and, uh, you know, finding out that this was a really, uh, Oh, I remember the following days. Now I was, I had just turned 10. I had just turned yeah. 10. I'm a whole year older than you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I grew up in, I grew up in Pennsylvania and, um, we were sent home from school. I don't remember really even knowing why it was a cloudy gray November cold day. I went home, I'm riding my bicycle around and, you know, it wasn't until I, I got home uh, from riding my bicycle around. I think I was just clueless at that point. And I got home and then I realized that, you know, something had happened. My father had a great job, uh, eight to five. And he came home at five and the paper wasn't there. His routine was he would come home from work and change and come down and read the newspaper. Newspaper wasn't there. And I, I remember him walking to the door and looking up and down the street. Remember paper boys? Sure. Well, he, yes, I was one at one time. Yeah, me too. He was looking up and down the street. Where's the paper boy? Where's the paper boy? Where's the paper boy? And then finally, you know, about two or three hours late, the local Lancaster New Era came out with great big, huge, you know, I forget whether 90 point huge letters, JFK assassinated with photographs. And I remember him just sitting there and shaking his head and sitting there and shaking his head and you know, the only thing I remember after that was Sunday, we had a color TV down in the basement. And Ooh. so we were all sitting watching the color TV down in the basement. And we saw uh, live on TV, Ruby shooting Oswald. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I didn't know what to make of it. I was 10 years old. And Doug, you probably had a lot more acumen than me back then. But anyhow, my father just was. Not necessarily. Just, There's something not right. What? that? That's not right. What? So we, you know. He, from the start, we didn't. We never really talked about it at all. After that, uh, we were very close. We, we were, you know, opposite ends of the political spectrum. But some things we would agree on. And in the '90s, when books started coming out, mm. he started the conversation one time and said, "Hey, have you read this?" I'm like, "No." He said, "Well, I really think, I think JFK was an organized crime hit." I'm like, "Oh, come on, that's crazy." That's just nuts. So I started reading a few things. And sure enough, I came to that conclusion. And I won't bore you again with my reasons that I stated before. But it just, I don't know, Brian, do you have any, I know you weren't alive at that time, but do you have any personal uh, uh, anecdotes to tell us about how this has so, affected you? Yeah, so I actually, um, when I started to do my research, uh, when I was 13 years old, um, I wow. actually went home and I talked to both my parents. They were um, both in high school in Geneva, New York. And I asked them, I said, what do you recall about that day? And they were both in school um, and they um, were both shocked and stunned. 
They, um, they, they both love Kennedy. Um, and my mom said she cried and, um, they both agreed that the nation changed that day. Mm. Oh that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, America as a whole changed. And, um, you know, um, that, uh, it was, you know, it, it, it would, it, it would actually be something that they will never forget, obviously. How do you think America changed that day? I think it did, but why do you, why and how do you think it changed on that day? Well, honestly, I think Kennedy was, he, he, he really, um, he, he, he was very, very sincere about, um, he did not want us to go full bore in to, um, in, uh, Vietnam. In, 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 yeah, in, in to Vietnam. I think his goal was to pull it out, pull all the troops out by Christmas of 1964. After think, the election. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I think, right. um, he was working on, um, the overall relationship with the Soviets, um, Mm -hmm. And he would really focus on the quote unquote um, the world peace talks, right? right. Um, I think that he had his plan of action of what he felt the city should be. And after he would kill President Johnson, um, took this nation in a completely different, uh, completely different yeah. direction, and then of course. The Vietnam War ramped up in 1964, and the nation changed. It yeah, did. I think uh, I think that's true. I mean, the nation lost some of its innocence, if you will. And don't forget, John F. Kennedy was perhaps the first television president. You know, when TV was starting to really, when TV was starting to come into its own, and the Vietnam War was the first television war yeah. when we were able to see. I mean, they were still developing film, but they were rushing it back pretty fast. Right. Uh, you know, and it was uh, much different than coverage of Korea or World War II. Um, and, you know, also when you look at Oswald and you, com and you compare him with other famous assassins, Squeaky Fromm, John J. Wilkes Jr., Booth, uh, Hanks, yeah. Sirhan Sirhan, James uh, Ray. You know, all of these people, they were all different. <laughs> these were not run of the mill people. These were not, these people were part of the, uh, the, they were outside of, um, you know, normal society. So that's deep. It's true. What, it's probably well, it true. true. If you look, if, and, true. you know, and you look at all of these shooters that we have now and these mass shootings that have been occurring throughout the country. They're all very similar. They're all people who cannot relate to the world at large. They're they're largely uh, very insular people. Uh, they have a different way of looking at the world. Um, and how do we stop them before they do whatever they do? Almost impossible. And those, so. those are terribly good questions. Those are terribly good questions. I mean, you know, a lot of them don't have a lot to do with each other. I mean, compare... Uh, Compare Lee Harvey Oswald to Squeaky Fromm, who took a shot at uh, Gerald, Gerald Ford. R. Ford. I mean, what do those Ford, two have man. to do with each other? That Lewiston, Maine shooter, yeah. you know, he had his own kind of a background. They're all very different. And I would contend that's why the mental health profession is never really going to get a handle on it. Because they all have, you're right, they're all, you know, outside of what we would consider norms, you know, going to work nine to five and coming home and reading the newspaper. They're all way outside of that. But, out, yeah. you know, what, what is it that they have in common that we can all, how are you going to, not to talk about one of our other episodes, but how are you going to stop a Brian Colbert if he's guilty? And I don't necessarily think he is, but how are you going to stop the next one? Yeah. You know, and I don't think. Very don't difficult. Think, Even yeah. with um, very strict gun laws, and in Massachusetts, we have the strictest gun laws in the nation, uh, even with strict gun laws. And I think there should be strict gun laws. And I think people who, who own guns think there should be strict gun laws. Well, you know what I'm going to say to that? And we're going to we're going to come right back to the Kennedy thing. 
prohibition didn't stop people from drinking and making booze, did it? In no, fact, no, no, that's how no. JFK's that's how JFK's family made the money that they have to sure. this day. They Old did. Joe Kennedy yeah. was a bootlegger. Your 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 famous government that you get put so much trust in that they should ban all these things. They tried back in the 1920s to ban booze. What did it do? It created a whole new booze industry and a bootlegging it industry, it and did. it created it really created organized crime. So you can you can ban all the guns you want, and I don't care because I don't have one, and I probably never will. I shouldn't say that, but you know <laughs> you can pass all the gun laws you want, but you know it's not going to stop crazy people from getting guns and doing crazy right. things. I'm sorry. Right. End of yeah. rant. <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, that could be a topic for yet another podcast. What's mm -hmm. that? <laughs> you ban guns. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah shootings, gun laws, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. All right. Any fa any final words, anyone? I think we're at the end of the, this particular approach to it. Again, we could go way deep into it. Um, yeah. I think the last time I checked, there were uh, upwards of a thousand books on the JFK assassination. No doubt. So mm -hmm. you know, we could go on forever. But anyhow, any last thoughts, folks? I do well, want to put in some closing thoughts that, you know, coming from a perspective as someone that, you know, wasn't alive during this time period and hasn't experienced as in depth to a lot of the experiences that you, Andrew and Brian have had um, with your research and Doug too, potentially, I don't know how deep into it you are, but I definitely started this podcast more of a similar mindset to Doug where, you know, I want to believe in our justice system and I want to believe, you know, that the government is telling us the truth. Um, but there are a lot of weird situations it's it's just hard it's hard also for me to even begin to comprehend with jack ruby how he was even able to get down there and shoot you know lee harvey oswald uh a lot of you know red flags and we may never know and like you said maybe a hundred years after his death new stuff will come out but i definitely agree that it's strange to redact stuff and national security you know how could hiding any of this information be related to national security? I think that, you know, this may be a situation where we never find out all the details. And if there are people being intimidated, that is something completely, you know, crazy and unbelievable. But I ask the people that are watching the podcast at home, if you've made it to this point to let us know what camp you're in, do you side with Andrew's story? Do you think that it was a mob hit? Are you more with Brian? Do you think that it was the mob and the CIA together? Or are you kind of more of the mindset of uh, Doug? <clears throat> where you think that, you know, it was just one person acting on their own. Which is when you think about, like, Jack Ruby, if he also is believed to have acted alone, it's just, like, crazy how, you know... It, <laughs> brain broken people are to be killing people but at the same time it is a whole different generation where they didn't have cell phones to be tracking things and they did mm -hmm. were able to get their hands on that right. one phone call but now you see nowadays it's so much harder to hide things like that just because they didn't the have cell phones yeah How crazy <laughs> honestly <laughs> it's crazy to think that it's really just an invention of like the past like 40 30 years but it's you know, back 60 years ago, you couldn't track anything really. I don't, I don't know how people did. I don't know how investigators did any of it. I mean, even now we have car chips in cars and we have our cell phones and these are things that we can't figure out. So with all this information, who's to say, you know, Brian closing thoughts. Well, um, you know, this is something that, um, you know, we will never fully know what happened. Um, I think in a hundred years, maybe the government will tell us this is all we know about it. Um, I still think they will never fully tell us. Um, and uh, this is something that um, uh, that people will c continue to write books about, do podcasts about. Um, and it is a topic. It is um, the crime of of the 20th century. It really is. Um, Doug, any closing thoughts? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brian. Did I yeah, you and uh, you know what? It's something that um, um, 
we will always um, we will always think and wonder about. And uh, you know, it's it's always uh, it's always a very uh, a fresh topic. Doug, any closing thoughts for us? Well, I would only quote uh, Kevin Costner as Crash Davis in the movie Bull Durham <laughs> when he was asked, what do you believe in? And he said, I believe Oswald acted alone. I think he said some other things in that quote, too, that I can't. we can't really He did. To. Um, <laughs> he believes, well, yeah, we can't get <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you very much, folks. Uh, please uh, subscribe and like below. And as uh, Lainey said, if you have comments, let us know. And I hope everybody has a great day. Bye. You have been watching About the Law, a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen, in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts, and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney-myers.com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions.